continuously cushioning us and protects our internal organs. The fat also contains various skin organs that are crucial for oxygen and nutrients that will keep coming and delivering nutrients and taking waste material from the surface of the skin. Both the blood vessels, the lymphatics, and the nerves. There are lots of nerve endings within the subdermis and the, cutaneous, the subcutaneous fat. Those nerve endings are crucial for our understanding of our environment, telling us when something is too hot, too cold, when we, it's too dry, basically telling us to change something in our environment to protect ourselves so that we don't have internal damage. If we get dehydrated, the skin will be the first to show. If we get stressed, stress will first show itself on our skin because whenever you are under significant stress emotionally or physically, your blood vessels constrict in the skin. And once they constrict, the blood is shunted towards the muscles and the brain. And the skin gets even more dehydrated and becomes more malnourished. So, stress is obviously going to affect our skin's health because without nourishment, oxygen, and waste reduction, we will have damaged skin. And what we eat makes a huge impact on this function of the skin. It also includes a whole immune section. We have our own very special immune cells that are located in the epidermis, the outermost layer of the skin, which is so thin it's about 0.3 or 0.4 millimeters. And even right on the surface of the skin, there are tentacles. Those tentacles are very narrow at the surface of the skin, but if you follow them, you will finally find immune cells called the cells of Langerhans or Langerhans cells. And they are the skin's own special immune providers. They tell our body that it's been exposed to something abnormal in its environment. We need that in the surface of the body because that's our exposure to almost everything that's surrounding us. So if you are exposed to too much sun, or to microbial agents, or to pollutants, they will actually trigger a response by those Langerhans cells. Those Langerhans cells will therefore become activated and start an inflammatory process, bringing other immune cells like macrophages, those Pac-Man cells, bring them to the surface of the skin to address these attacks by the microbes or pollutants, causing additional inflammation, which leads to free radical damage, and every time you have inflammation in the body, you will have free radical damage associated with it. Free radicals are those really unstable molecules that cause the aging of the skin. Therefore, pollution, microbial stress in the environment, emotional stress, insufficient circulation of the skin, running marathons all the time, which takes away the blood from your skin, again, bring it to the muscle. Any kind of physical or emotional, pollutional, chemical, physiological stress would lead to aging of the skin. And that is why you're here. Your skin is important to you and you don't even care if it has Langerhans cells. You don't care if it's important for immunity or if it's important to cushioning or if it is protecting as a barrier against environmental pollutants and microbes. You just want it to look good. And why is it important to you? Because intuitively you know that it reflects on your health. That your skin is the telltale sign of how old you are, physiologically if not chronologically. And you want to do something about it before everybody will be able to tell that you're, you are a flower that has been wilting. Nobody wants to wilt. Even if we know we have to accept it at a certain time of our life, why shouldn't we slow it down? Why shouldn't we remain vibrant and vital? And the skin tells everybody around us how vibrant or vital we truly are. Some people at age 60 look extremely vital. 
and some people at age 30 already have the skin's chronological age appears to be 50 or 55. I've seen people who at age 40 have a skin with such deep, deep grooves and dryness that if you only look at their skin at the face, they look like they're 70. Therefore, you can never say it's all about the age. It's not about age. It's about physiological behavior. It's about trauma. It's about stress. It's about the environment and what we do with our own body that will ultimately lead to the skin's appearance of aging. Nothing else, nothing more. The genetics are very small. The genetics are, have almost no impact on your skin's health and its vitality and usefulness. Your lifestyle does, and we're going to talk about various things about your lifestyle that change how you look and make people subconsciously realize just by looking at you more or less how old you really are. And when you do something about these things, you can actually reverse something and get your skin to look younger again without surgery, without facelift, but some things that are very small, very simple. You had a question? Um, about the so, that is a very good example on, if you just listen, ultimately your question will be answered, even if you don't ask it. So just be patient, we'll get to it. And at the end, you'll be able to ask what I didn't get to. Okay? She wanted to ask me how old I was. That's why, I, that is one question I maybe will refuse to answer because I'm just one person. I'm not an example. I have abused my body as anybody has abused their body. Um, and I still do it. And people who have a cell phone that's still on are never going to have a question that I will answer anyway. So that's that age question is not going to be answered anymore. If you have your cell phones on, please turn them off now. OK, so several things appear on our skin when it gets damaged. First, let's talk about the sun. This is important because Israeli society is a very trendy society. It likes to follow. It doesn't like self-analysis and discerning thinking. Whatever we hear is done in America, we want to do it here, no matter what it is. It's, um, it came from America, it must be good. This is where we suffer a lot because we take things that Americans might be a little more discerning about and say, oh, we don't want to go to McDonald's. But here, McDonald's is considered good and even the educated academicians go to McDonald's. In America, only the uneducated go there. Almost entirely, you don't see. You see some minorities who have no opportunities and they go to pay a dollar fifty for a whole meal, which is not worth anything, if they, even if they had to uh, be paid to eat it. But they have no choice. They have to get the calories. And we are so trendy that in the health food movement, we start assuming that anything that came from America, like concepts such as superfood. Who heard the concept superfood? Raise your hand. You see how trendy it is? Yesterday when I came from the airport, I was picked up by a friend who was into health food and raw foodism. And she already has come to quite a few of my lectures. She's listened to the Truth About Your Food series. I thought that she already knows better. But even she followed the same trend. And she started naming all those superfoods and asking me individually, superfoods? I'll get to that. Uh, naming superfoods and asking me if they're actually good for her. And each one was worse than the one before it. They're horrible. They're not super, they're sub foods. They're non foods. They're just expensive items that people love to follow the trend of eating, thinking that they're doing something good, while in reality they damage their body. Like raw cacao, for example. Raw cacao. Raw cacao. Raw chocolate, raw cacao. 
It's a trend. It's a trend that was started in the U.S. by people who wanted to sell. Raw chocolate, raw cacao. It's a trend. It's a trend that was started in the U.S. by people who wanted to sell a stimulant to unsuspecting people who obviously like to get addicted to those stimulants and would like to believe that it's good for them. It's just like somebody who would prove to you that beer is the healthiest thing for you and you'll be happy about it. And they would call it a superfood, just so that you will have a nice name, a nickname for it that you'd say, oh, I'm eating a superfood right now. So there are quite a few of those superfoods that she has named, like raw cacao and goji berries and maca root and uh, microalgae like the super blue green algae, etc. And these are all trends in the U.S. and they have come to the Israeli population and many people are doing their research on the internet and they love to know what's going on in the U.S. and they eat those things. They don't know that those things are nothing more than sales gimmicks in the U.S. and they are such a trendy thing that only the raw food movement or the natural hygiene movement followers are actually ingesting or bothering it because they are always thinking something might be missing in their body and they think by taking superfood they're going to stay younger and healthier and more vital but in reality they lose vitality they lose the energy and they become polluted which obviously will destroy their skin as well also they will start eating large amounts of flax seed and flax oil chia seeds or chia seed oil which I'm sure some of you have already done, gone into that route believing again that you are following a good trend. But in reality, when I look at my patients who have been fairly healthy, eating a so-so diet, nothing perfect, suddenly went on that bandwagon, feeling really good about themselves, within a year they looked older. Why? Why do they look like their skin is forming sudden wrinkles in it. It gets dry, it has a drapery effect when the skin overgrows by comparison to the volume of the subcutaneous tissue it has too much skin and it becomes like a drape, a drapery which forms more and more wrinkles and it starts sagging because there's no pressure to hold the muscle within it so the muscle weight pulls down and you start having these deep grooves here because your cheeks start falling down since the skin is not tight enough to hold it back where it was. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know that's one of the signs is of aging is having this deep groove getting deeper and deeper. Why did they have that? Some of them perhaps moved to a warmer climate because a part of going with the trend is to shift your climate to something warmer like going to Phoenix, Arizona or other dry desert places where you're not going to suffer through the, through the northern winters of the US. As soon as they do that, because they have lost protection, and I'll tell you in a minute what I mean by that, they lost protection of the skin, as soon as they are exposed to a lot of sun and dryness, the skin collapses because it's the last straw. But even if they didn't go that far, even if they stayed within the cold, typical climate of northern United States, many of them start having an aging, sagging, dry and wrinkly skin because of the free radical damage that derives from eating all those highly polyunsaturated fats that they thought were good for them, like flax oil and chia seed oil. Those are omega-3 oils. And you would like to think that omega-3 is good for you, and it is if it is stable. But if it is rancid, it will destroy your skin because it will incorporate itself into your subcutaneous tissue, which is fat. Oil dissolves in oil. You get those oily, unstable molecules, fatty acids that are omega-3 fatty acids, 
they become rancid as soon as they're exposed to your own body's heat, oxygen, and before you get into your body, they're exposed to light, which leads them to become free radicals. They get incorporated, because they're still fat soluble, into your subcutaneous fat, and once they are within it, they cause a chain reaction of free radicals that are formed within the subcutaneous fat, so the entire skin is now padding, or is padded by rancid fat. Those rancid molecules, or free radicals, are bombarding the dermis directly. The dermis is where you are forming your skin. The dermis is where the skin layers that are alive, where they are replicating and gradually forming additional layers until finally you get to the epidermis, which is mostly dead keratinized cells. Very thin and flat, squamous cells, they're called. <coughs> Those squamous cells are not so alive. They depend entirely on what's happening with the living cells in your dermis. And the living cells of the dermis are directly affected by free radical in the subcutaneous fat. Now, your skin is getting directly damaged because that is what free radicals do. They destroy cell membrane, they destroy the DNA, they destroy nuclear membrane, they destroy enzymes and their activities. No wonder your skin starts aging when you eat these oils that somebody told you are the trendy thing to eat. Because they are superfoods. And all of a sudden you start doing something so unnatural, like eating two or three or four teaspoons or even tablespoons of flax every day. Because you think it's, that's good for you. And worse, the oil that they're from it. Be aware that this oil is so unstable that um, they have genetically modified it to add more omega-6 fatty acids to it. In Canada, the omega-3 oils coming from flax were so unstable with omega-3 oils, with omega-3 fats, so unstable that they had to modify them to become more and more omega-6. And omega-6 caused more inflammation in the body. So you're thinking you're getting omega-3, but you're getting a lot more omega-6 than you bargained for which is more stable, therefore it becomes more worthy of human consumption. If you get omega-3 from flax oil, it's not for human consumption. They cannot even sell it because it goes so rancid so fast. What is the best way to prevent you from knowing that it went rancid? To, ra to roast it. When you roast it or bake it or cook it in high temperature, you would lose the taste of rancidity. And you will think it's okay. It so tastes good now, but it's still rancid as bad as before. That is why you should never just look at the list of ingredients in the food you buy. You should imagine in your own smart mind what those foods have been through after they put the ingredients together. Have they baked it? Have they roasted it? Have they broiled it? That will change everything. The ingredients are not going to be the same. And oftentimes, obviously, the heat itself will make the oils rancid if there was any bit of them that was still not rancid. So this is how people get very rapidly aging. There is a lot of omega-3 oils that are unstable. Instead of getting stable omega-3 oils, which you get mostly in green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetable, those are stable. In the seeds, it's not stable? It's, oh, well, you want to do the lecture? <laughs> <laughs> Flax seeds are seeds. Chia seeds are seeds. I just explained how those are extremely unstable. Is that all seeds or just those two? <laughs> Even the seeds. The oil within those seeds is very unstable. It's not so bad in very small amounts, as long as it is digestible and not allergenic, and does not have too many hormone mimickers and other issues. Uh, if you eat walnuts, they are rich with omega-3, and if they are raw and have been kept in their
refrigerator or in the freezer, you'll get some omega-3 that's relatively stable only because you kept it frozen. That's really the important part. Pumpkin seeds also have a good amount of omega-3. But if you allow them again to be heated, roasted, salted, or uh, blended for a long time and kept out in, in the warm air, they will go rancid because they are unstable. Omega-3 oil, by definition, especially if they are in seeds, where they are designed to be liquid in cold temperature, they are the most unstable oils. And you cannot rely on them unless you pick them straight from the tree or get them after they've been refrigerated by those who did pick them from the tree. Whether it's walnuts or pumpkin seeds or almonds, uh, whatever nuts contain omega-3, they will not be stable unless they have been refrigerated the whole time after they've been picked or kept in the shelves. If you get them pre-cut, pre-shelled, you do want to get them refrigerated. In my restaurant, we always keep them refrigerated. We get them frozen and keep it straight in the fridge so when we sell them or use them, they are not rancid yet. And you may need to take vitamin E if you want to reduce the rancidity once they enter your body. Vitamin E is deficient in most people, which affects your skin too. Almost everybody in our society, because of food fads or because of abuse of our liver using various related to eating high fructose corn syrup, high fructose agave nectar, high fructose yakon syrup, or fasting, like juice fasting, which gives us sometimes a huge amount of fructose in a big bolus that our liver is not able to handle too much in too short of a time. Every time we juice the fruit instead of blend the fruits, we lose all the fiber. We get a large amount of fructose coming in simultaneously. Our liver can't handle it. Every time we damage the liver by doing that, or by taking out our gallbladder, or going on a very low-fat diet, we suddenly change our liver's ability to metabolize fats. When that happens, we often don't secrete enough bile salts and bile acids to emulsify and digest and absorb fats from our diet. When that happens, we might not gain weight and we might feel good about it, but after a year or two years, we will start having significant fat-soluble nutrient deficiency. Those are vitamin A, beta-carotene, other carotenoids, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, all of which are crucial for our health and for protecting our fatty layers under our skin. If you don't have fat soluble antioxidants, your fatty areas will go rancid even faster. This is why I said when they went to Arizona, it was the last straw for them. They already ate out of rancid foods. The fat was not healthy anymore. It incorporated into their skin. All they needed now was some exposure to the sun. As soon as they had some exposure that was excessive and dryness or pollution, the free radical damage came both from the outside and from the inside, affecting the dermis and the epidermis synergistically, causing curative damage and aging of the skin. You don't want to do all those things simultaneously. If you do something bad, do only one at a time. If you do two or three, you're going to see the results a lot faster. And it will be much harder to reverse, to change them. Everybody is being told to stay out of the sun as if the sun is the main culprit. Now you understand that it is not. But if you eat the right type of foods, your skin will actually be more resilient and will stay in good shape for a much longer amount of time, even under the hot summer sun in this country. You can be in the sun five times more and not have any negative impact. The skin will still not age. But if you eat rancid food, you won't be able to be in the sun for a lot, a lot longer than a few minutes. The damage will really start happening. So don't let the skin doctors tell you 
This is just about the sun. Your diet is much more important than the sun is. And in fact, if the sun is good for you, you need the sun for protection against melanoma. The worst skin cancer, the one that you are getting scared to believe the sun is, is a horrible devil that makes you get lethal melanomas. It's actually the opposite. Close to 80% of all melanomas are forming only in the places in your body where the sun won't shine. And I'm not referring to your anus. <laughs> I'm referring to any place that is continuously covered by the sun. The whitest areas are the most risky. If you see a heavily pigmented lesion, a dark spot that gets darker in a very white background in an area that has never been much in the sun, those are the most dangerous ones. Usually they're flat. You can have them on the palms, between the fingers, where you, the sun usually does not shine because you don't hold your hands like this all the time. Right? Unless you are some kind of a Buddhist. Also at the bottom of your, your feet. Very common place for melanomas. The place where the sun didn't shine. Between your toes. Those are the places you have to watch out because it could save your life. Those that are surrounding your crotch area under your bathing suit, if you tend to wear skimpy bathing suits, those would be the area that have never been exposed to the sun, around the breast. Underneath the hair, right in the back of the neck, where often the sun does not get to shine. Those are the places that you have the worst melanoma, sometimes on the belly and on the back, if you tend to be more modest about your clothing. Religious people have a lot more melanomas because they almost never go out to the sun. I'm talking about the Orthodox uh, that are dressing heavily. They have a higher risk for melanoma because they almost never go out to be in the sun. They don't make vitamin D, which protects your... It's an antioxidant as well as a hormone that protects you from 20 types of cancer. As well as serves as an antioxidant protecting your brain. If you don't make vitamin D, your skin is not protected, and also your fat metabolism is affected, and your sugar metabolism is affected. Vitamin D is crucial to prevent diabetes, no. not just cancer, cardiovascular disease, depression, and other mood disorders. These are all crucial for vitamin D presence. The skin is therefore not just an organ of protection, it's an organ where you, prote where you protect your whole body by making vitamin D. You are told to stay out of the sun, and the doctors who tell you that have been brainwashed by the SPF industry, not by science. The science tells the doctor what I just told you. 80% are not in the places where the sun ever shines, are only in places where the sun won't shine. And they tell you the opposite because they have been brainwashed, and that is why the skin doctors themselves die sometimes from melanomas, because they don't think it can possibly be a melanoma since it came in an area where the sun never shines. And they have been taught that the sun is the cause. But now you know it isn't. A lot of people's lives were saved just by understanding this because they looked a little better at their skin lesion. And I find many times those precursors to melanomas, which can be treated really early without surgery. If it's really early, you can catch it, and it is as if you had nothing more than a very, very shallow, thin carcinoma, which is very easy to treat and eliminate. <coughs> Nip it in the bud, instead of waiting until what? Observing, following up, monitoring, watching for it, until what? What are you waiting for? When you keep going, if you are a farmer, an athlete, um, a gardener, people who are all the time outdoors because of their job, or because they just love being outdoors, and they don't protect themselves at all, they have a few areas of their body exposed to the sun excessively, like the nose, the bridge of the nose, 
the cheeks, the temples, the forehead, the back of the hands, the chest area that's exposed to the sun. Those are the areas where you are getting excessive exposure and they are going to be suffering a higher likelihood of basal cell carcinoma, sometimes squamous cell carcinoma. Those are less invasive cancers. They don't cause as big of a problem. But they cover broad areas that are not so visible. They take a long time before you can start seeing them. First, the skin will become a little rough. And you can feel it if you put your fingers right underneath your eyes and go very, very gently, don't go too hard, very gently around the eye, on the temple, on the forehead, down the, the bridge of the nose and both sides of the bridge. If you feel any roughness when you do that, that roughness could be the start of a solar keratosis. The hardening and the proliferating of skin cells resulting from sun damage from one hand and food damage from the inside out. That combination is the main cause for carcinomas of the skin. This is the beginning. After you have that original, original roughness, it can get a little thicker and sometimes it gets darker. And then you have dark spots in different places. Sometimes on the arms, that's an also highly exposed. Sometimes on the legs, if you're always wearing shorts. Those are solar keratosis, and they should be removed. Solar keratosis. They should be removed because they have a high risk of developing into carcinoma. I said again, it's not as bad as melanoma. It does not spread throughout your body and kills you like melanoma does but it is much more common, especially in those areas that have been exposed. If you have this type of a condition, you want to have it looked and removed right away again instead of waiting, because this is where you are most exposed, your face, your hands. You don't want to end up with big craters and big scars. Also, please remember, the sun does not say, I'm only going to go to your nose. The sun is, is covering the whole area. It's a broad area. Therefore, in all likelihood, the keratotic lesion is going to be very broad in scope, in area, in space. It's not going to be one little area that happened to be rough. Because the rough area becomes scaly. And the scales then get peeled off by themselves when they don't have enough support they simply fall. And all of a sudden, oh, I don't have that problem anymore. But it comes back. Within a couple of months or three months, the cycle begins again. It takes about six weeks for the skin to regenerate itself from the bottom to the top. So within six to eight weeks, you're going to start having this keratotic lesion starting again. You say, oh, I thought it was already gone, but it's there again. And it might actually be next time in an adjacent area because a bigger area has been affected, not just one spot. So at different times, different parts of the skin are going to become keratotic and slough off. And this is the progression of the disease of the skin until finally it gets both heavily raised, heavily uh, crusty, it can even have ulceration in the center and bleeding sometimes. And that's already the carcinoma, the cancer. At that time, most skin surgeons are going to feel justified in causing major trauma and, and disfiguration, disfigurement to your skin. They cannot justify ruining somebody's face when it's just a small keratosis. Because if the method is mostly a surgical method, it's too invasive to keep your skin looking good after the treatment. Therefore, they almost prefer to wait because you're going to be really mad at your doctor if your skin is going to look a lot worse after the treatment than how it was before the treatment. And that's why they tend to wait. 
and watch until now it's bad enough. And now they have developed, have you heard the most procedure? Most procedure. Most. M O H S. Most. The most procedure is one of the most barbaric procedures created by skin specialists. And it is basically ignoring the cause and progression of the disorder. It became a way for skin doctors to feel perhaps more important about themselves. Are you a skin doctor? Yeah. Okay. But you're coming at me. Oh, I had it on my face. Okay. Um, the most procedure basically says this. If there is a squim, if there is a basic cell carcinoma, we're not going to simply remove it like we used to and cause a local damage, local, local crater or scarring or stitching on the face. We're going to keep going and looking for more cancer that might be around the area that we have originally seen. And instead of just removing that one area, they keep taking strips of skin, one after the other, and look at it under the microscope while the patient is lying there for hours and hours. And they keep looking in the microscope and say, oh, there's more cancer. We didn't get it all. Let's do another, and another, and another. And sometimes, first of all, they cut through cancer. You don't want to cut through cancer so many times. That's risky. Second, because they keep taking more and more pieces, the scarring, the disfigurement becomes greater and greater. Then they have to do skin grafts. Many times they have to do major stitches. Sometimes I see people with a scar from here to here. The whole thing is one zigzagging scar of the most procedure. And they justify it because they forget that they might as well take it for granted that there will be some cancerous activity in the whole area. After all, it came from the same sun. Why should it be only here? It will be in the whole area. If you look for cancer, you will find it. Does it mean you have to disfigure the whole person's face? You don't. There are better ways. You can slough it from the outside only, very thin layer, and do it just gently in small sections as needed. It's not aggressive cancer. You don't have to destroy a person's face for it. And you don't have to look. You already know. If you know in advance that the cancer is going to be broad, why bother? It makes no sense. It's like ignoring the physiology of the, of the progression of the disease. If anybody tells me that they are scheduled for most years, people will say we can't believe that our skin doctors were still in the Middle Ages doing the most procedure, thinking that they are so sophisticated while they were doing it. It's just a horrible. I believe that they think they're doing the right thing. But they have been brainwashed to do it, and they felt smug and comfortable doing it. And they couldn't have been even thinking of doing it unless they were told to ignore the causation of the disorder. If you understand the causation, you would never do that. You would understand how it's formed at the end. So this is about skin cancer, carcinomas, sun exposure, and remember, a little sun is great, too much sun is not. But you need sun. And when you are not going to get sun exposure, that's when you are wearing the hat or the long sleeve or something that protects you. But don't use those SPF, high SPF factor uh, creams, and if you want to make vitamin D, don't take a shower before you go out in the sun. <laughs> so you need the natural skin oil to make vitamin D. I heard afterwards as well. Well, afterwards you already made the vitamin D. So it's okay if you want to take a shower. But don't overdo showers anyway because the water contains fluoride which destroys your skin. And chlorine, chlorine, that also dries your skin, opens the pores, and causes additional free radical damage. So long showers, when you know that the water has been polluted by your own government, by your own city, adding fluoridation into it with heavy metals and other toxins to accommodate the 
fertilizing industry that are making fluorosilicic acid and they don't know how to get rid of it. So they found a way to follow the trend in the US, which is let's fluoridate the water with this toxic waste. And now we're forcing all the babies and children to be poisoned by excessive fluoridation, which makes them have bone damage, high risk of cancer, and lowered IQ, and other problems. Apart from that, they're okay. Well, apart from that, they, they think they may have good no, teeth. No cavities, right? Yeah, even that is not necessarily proven. Not at these doses, which are far higher than we should have. It. But uh, short showers are good for your skin. I, I mean short as opposed to having too long of a shower. The shorter they are, and the cooler the water, the better. And the least amount of soap. In nature, the most you would have done is jump into a lake, jump into a pond or a river. You wouldn't use soap. You would just get water to run over your skin. You would cool down, you would feel clean, and you'd move on. <laughs> and that's it. Now we're staying in the water for such a long time. We continuously dry our skin, eliminate the natural moisturizer that we have in our sebum, that's secreted by the sebaceous gland. We end up with skin that is dry, porous, and allowing toxins in. That damages the sebaceous gland even further, drying them. Then they try to secrete when they are still uh, very thick secretions, and they get blocked, and then we get acne. And then we get boils and cysts and blackheads. That's because we have not treated our skin correctly. In nature, it will not happen. That we don't expose to sun, like the chest areas and those that we never expose to sun. It's time to expose them once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Find a good secluded place and, and go some sunbathing. So, why don't you take vitamin D in the capsule form? You can take vitamin D in, in various forms. That's for vitamin D. But you still need some sun. In How much is some sun? Like we said earlier, 10, 15 minutes <laughs> on each part of your skin. It is, I think it should be a national rule. Instead of having those big sirens every few days, every few days? to have a siren at noon or at one telling the whole society to go out in the sun. <laughs> no, that's the only time of the day you can make vitamin D. You mean uh, that's not yeah. Sam, you won't make vitamin D? You will not make so vitamin D. Sam, you won't make no. vitamin D. But I thought only mad dogs and English women have <laughs> Now you know how you have been fooled. You need the sun to be at the highest zenith, closest to the, to the top, to make vitamin D. And even in Israel, southern that it is, during the three months of uh, November, December, January, you don't make any vitamin D because the sun is too far to the south. During those three months, you need to take some vitamin D supplementation or you need to have enough vitamin D made in your body. It's fat soluble, so it will accumulate in your fatty tissues for a month or two months until, until the spring arrives and you can make more vitamin D again. What foods provide you with vitamin D? If you're saying in the winter, it's Supplements. No, you are storing it in the summer, right. and you should use those storage for the winter. Right. Or take some supplements in the winter. Some people take hot liver oil, but it's highly polluted with heavy metals, petrochemicals, dioxins, and many other toxins. So I don't recommend for people to take fish oil for the purpose of vitamin D repletion. So that is about the sun. The sun is a nutrient for you, it provides you with vitamin D, so you have to take it very seriously as food. But remember, the sun will cause only the damage that you will allow to happen by eating your own large amount of rancid oil, which happen when you eat too many seeds. Excessive amount of seeds and nuts that contain unstable, really dark one. Every time you see a dark spot, whether it's protruding or not, you should pay attention to it and you should have it immediately looked at and hopefully removed in a natural, 
non-invasive, non-aggressive, non-surgical way. Like this one. Also, you want to see if the border is demarcated, if the border is sharp, or if it is irregular, if it is symmetrical or asymmetrical, if the pigment is even or unevenly distributed, if it's changing. All of those are important features for paying attention, although the best thing is to remove it before it gets to that point. Sometimes a lesion can get affected by a mosquito bite, and suddenly there's inflammation next to it and you're going to scratch and traumatize and it starts bleeding. Now you are causing cellular replication because every time you bleed, the DNA has to replicate and the cells are dividing much faster which increases the risk for mutation. Therefore, anything that sticks out has a higher risk of becoming something we don't want because of the high risk of mutation. If you have a birthmark, Oh, there's a much bigger one right here. That is dark and flat. If you have something that you were born with and you say, oh, I had it all my life. That is the worst thing. The longer you have it, the higher the risk of mutation. Because it's been around the sun, the food that you've been eating, the pollutants that have been affecting your longer hand cell and causing, causing inflammation. Every time you have inflammation, you have free radical damage. Free radical damage damages the DNA causing misplaced base pairs on your genes, causing a higher risk of cancer development. So the longer you have things, and birthmarks are 10 to 20 times riskier for developing cancer within them than normal skin does. So never tell me, oh, I had it all my life, as if that's the reason to keep it. No, if you're really attached to it emotionally, you can always keep it in a wallet size <laughs> after it's been taken off. Take it we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Good question. Almost like I planted you right there. Now let's look at something really interesting. The real reason I asked her, not just because she has beautiful specimens. You can be so proud now. But look at the shapes. Look at how we have here several that are in one line. And these are obviously two belonging together somehow. If you look at them, you'll see that they're shaped slightly elongated. You see, this is a little oblong. And this is also a little oblong, and so is this, oblong. That's because they are following the spinal nerve distribution. This is really interesting. Our skin and our nerves were made from the same part of our embryo. When we were embryos, we once had only two layers, the epiblast and the hypoblast. The epiblast has ultimately evolved during embryogenesis, while we are in the uterus, into both the entire nervous system and the entire skin. Therefore, if we have any kind of irritation, whether it's genetic, chemical, nutritional, or pollutional, or mechanical, any kind of irritation to the nerves will manifest on the skin and vice versa. They're intimately connected, the skin and your whole central nervous system. If you are under a lot of stress emotionally, that's another reason why you're affecting your skin directly through the nervous system, which does not only bring information, sensory information, from the skin to the brain to tell us that the environment is changing, heat, cold, pain, pressure, bugs walking on us, these kind of things, but it also feeds the skin. The nervous system provides nutrients to the surface of the skin, and if the nerves are irritated, the skin will grow excessively because of that trophic feeding nutritive effect. So here's what, the, what results. She was born with a slight genetic tendency. The genetic tendency made her nerves more easily irritable by various environmental factors, nutritional factors, pollution, and emotion. It is a variant of a condition called von Recklinghausen disease, also known as neurofibromatosis. 
neurofibromatosis. You heard about that? <laughs> Some people have much longer, much bigger lumps than she does, and they have so many, and they always follow the spinal nerve distribution. That is why they're elongated along the spinal nerves. As they follow those distribution, if they have enough of them, they look like they have a Christmas tree right on their, on their back, because it goes like this, following the spinal nerve, the whole way. And this is why she has this here, because the spinal nerve go back, go from, from the side through the rib cage, between the rib, and they go to the front, all the way to the sternum. So you can see that she was irritated right from this spinal nerve, which started right here in the area of the neck, and it started right here. This is where she developed this. It comes from the same nerve root. Isn't that an interesting person? <laughs> These are really good. You see how it started on both sides of the spinal cord, going right there inside the rib cage and coming out in the front. Amazing. Just you. Just going to ask for better specimens. I was just going to say one thing. Then my dad is exactly like it's a matching set. It's it's a genetic tendency. Yeah. Exactly. Is this say. something she has to? Mm -hmm. Or is it just something she has to be aware of? I'll mention it. Do you want to stand here while I mention it? Or I, why are you standing here? Let's go a little, a little further. <laughs> oh. you know. So she had already done a surgery here. Somebody tried to remove one of those. See that big scar? So we, that's a little really too much of a scar. We don't like that. But um, usually they do only one, and if it's not cancerous, they, they won't bother with anything else. They'll just leave it there until maybe something will change and then they will do something else. So we don't like to, to wait. We just like to remove and not to worry about it. As far as what does it mean? No, thank you very much. <laughs> I always, before I lecture about skin, I have to spot somebody. So <laughs> when I came in, I Yes. Um, so this is a genetic tendency, this bone break and housing. It can come in a very mild form and a very advanced form. People who have it in advanced form have pain, have dysfunction, have discomfort, because the nerves are always irritated and they cause all those globules on the skin. But even if you have a mild form, it means that there is irritation. When you are exposed to chemicals, pesticides, hormones, insecticides, those chemicals are neurotoxic. They accumulate in the nervous system and increase its, um, its irritability which would lead to increased rate of mold. And many people who never had mold when they, when they were born, over the years start developing more and more lesions on their skin. When you look at them, automatically you think that they're older than they really are. Because those skin lesions, when they protrude on your nose, on your cheek, on your forehead, right underneath your eyelid, or on your eyelid, or even touching your eyeballs, they are distracting from the rest of the face and they give you a picture of lack of vitality. Nobody looks vital when they have mold on their face. Even if they have been accustomed to them and even if their grandma was kind and sweet enough to tell them that it's beautiful. Or even told them that it was a beauty mark. Which really was a euphemism for when we didn't know what to do about it, so might as well learn to live with it. But now we know what to do about it and what we can do about it and why we should. It's very easy. There's no reason to euphemize it by calling it a beauty mark. It is something that develops as a result of irritation, therefore it's a pathological development. The skin is designed to be smooth. There are reasons for that. If the skin is not smooth, and we have growths that are asymmetrical. In her case, they were fairly symmetrical. Some of them were not symmetrical. They had you know, a few that were not. If you are not symmetrical, you are sending messages to the central nervous system in an uneven fashion. And that could affect you more or less depending on where in the nervous system you will have the asymmetry. If this asymmetry occurs in the brainstem, it will affect you dramatically because the brainstem is directly connected with your basal nuclei, the hypothalamus, the limbic system, the hippocampus, 
the orbital frontal nucleus, all those important parts of the brain that have to do with emotions and that have to do with autonomic nervous system control, temperature regulation, dryness of the skin or moisture thereof. Everything has to do with the hypothalamus and how it affects our entire skin's physiology based on the messages it gets from the environment. And here it's getting uneven messages from the outside inwards. Suddenly, you have a, a big mole on your, on your cheek and your whole body becomes dry. And you don't even know it. Because nobody even tells you that it's a possibility. And you remove it and suddenly your whole skin becomes moist again. I've seen it happen. And we have the physiological explanation for that. It sounds almost mythical, doesn't it? Almost magical. But this area, the face down to here, is directly connected to the brainstem. And that is why the impact on the hypothalamus is so significant. I've seen people with lesions on their head, large lesions on the scalp, which were associated, unbeknownst to them, with constant anxiety attacks. But as soon as I removed them, using this non-surgical, non-damaging, non-traumatizing, non-invasive nutritional approach, suddenly the anxiety attacks disappeared, as soon as the lesions came off. It's directly connected with your emotional centers in the brain. This is a nice feature. It's very physiological. All of those skin lesions have different names like moles, nevuses, pigmented, non-pigmented, complex melanocytic nevus, compound melanocytic nevus, simple melanocytic or non-melanocytic nevus, all those names are fancy names, but basically you can all call them lesions, skin lesions. Anything that is abnormal in the skin, even if you call it a beauty mark, is simply called lesion. Is a wart a lesion too? Wart is a lesion too, it's from a virus. Is a wart a lesion too? Wart is a lesion too, it's from a virus. But it's still a lesion. If you have a lot of lesions around your neck, and some people here I've noticed already have little skin tags around their neck, and sometimes they have skin tags that are bigger and fatter in the armpits or under their breast, those are resulting from hormonal imbalance. Do you think that has to do with nutrition and diet? Mm -hmm. Absolutely it does. But I get to that. No, I Okay, well, we'll do diagnosis later, okay? No, I can't. Yeah, every time the skin is not typical, you are going to call it a lesion. And that is something that is indicating that there is some type of pathology. We're going to have a five minute break, and afterwards we will talk a little more about what we can do about this. Okay. 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 This basically just went off. Right. Once something has developed on your skin, you have to decide what's causing it and how it relates to your lifestyle. If we have these skin regions called uh, skin tags all over your neck and under your breast and your armpits, they mean that you have estrogen dominance. You're eating too many, feed, too many foods containing estrogen mimickers. For example, drinking water from plastic bottles. <laughs> That's one thing that people have gotten used to doing, which I have, I'm totally against. Try and use glass bottles all the time, or glasses to drink from. And don't buy these, don't rely too much on these plastic bottles. They're okay for once in a, in a blue moon or once in a party when there's no other good option. But that's not a good long-term long solution. But they don't sell them in glass. No, you can buy a glass, you have to 
Purify your own water in your own kitchen and then you can use the glass. Also, do not eat foods containing a lot of pesticides which are themselves hormone mimickers. And soybeans and flax seeds have a high amount of phytoestrogens in them. And if people eat soybeans all the time or soy products and flax every day, they may also get too much estrogenicity which also can translate to some acne in some cases, skin problem, but more importantly, the irritation, the hormonal imbalance leads again the nervous system to bring growth at the skin surface in certain susceptible areas. Those skin lesions, skin tags are irritating, they're uncomfortable, they can get injured by necklaces or other mechanical devices that people have by fingernails inadvertently while you're asleep and that's not a good thing. They're not too dangerous but nobody likes them because intuitively you can tell that they shouldn't be there. I've removed sometime in one sitting 500 of them on one person. It's so easy to do with just a matter of time and budget to do all of them at once. Sometimes people just say clean my neck and the neck has hundreds all over it. Just takes a while. It's like ant work. You do each one individually and it doesn't hurt. Do you use laser or do you use... Uh, it doesn't hurt. Freeze it? It's not a freezing because that would be a surgery. If you do anything surgical, it would be too painful to tolerate more than 10 of them. And I can do 100 in one sitting. This is something that even a two-year-old baby can handle. 